True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. For three years, he'd sat waiting for this moment, when the key would turn in the lock and he'd be free, free to start again, or free to continue with exactly what he'd begun three years before. Only this time, there would be no witnesses, no one to shout and call attention. They would be silenced forever. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to Episode 73, The Capitol Hill Murders. This episode is sponsored by CBS Justice. This week's episode covers the crimes of a man who'd been in prison and then he was released. And there's a brand new 10-part original true crime series which covers crimes around this exact scenario, Released to Kill, which starts this weekend on CBS Justice. If you think parolees reoffending is a uniquely South African problem, think again. One in five UK murders is committed by an ex-prisoner. From violent offenders to cold-blooded killers, this chilling series reveals how criminals, once released from prison, went on to kill innocent people, some in just a matter of days. Be sure to catch episode one this Sunday, the 13th of February, at 7pm on DSTV, channel 170. A huge thank you to CBS Justice for sponsoring this episode of True Crime South Africa. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new supporters for the week. A huge thank you goes out to Sarah Diaga, Kim Harris, Candice, Dean Philby, Clarissa Ferreira, Melanie Barr and Mivette Peters for your support on Patreon. Thank you so much everyone. It really does make a huge difference. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave a link in the show notes. There are now additional ways that you can support the show, with two online businesses providing 10% discounts when you use the code TCSA10 at checkout. You can get your health and beauty needs at King Online, and you can get your printing requirements designed, printed and delivered by PrintCrowd. You can also help to support me as an individual creator by checking out the companion podcast I created with Showmax for the Devil's Dorp documentary, or by purchasing the Krugersdorp Cult Killings audiobook on Audible, Google Play Books, or Apple Books. As always, any form of support is greatly appreciated, and it doesn't have to be financial. Sharing of episodes, inviting your friends and family to listen, and interacting on social media all go a long way to keeping the show growing and improving. You can also leave a review on the podcast app you use to listen. If your podcast platform does not have that option, a Google or Facebook review is equally helpful. Parole for sex offenders is a very contentious issue, and rightly so. Not only does the data show that, especially in situations where sexual offences are violent, the likelihood that the offender will stop at one offence without significant intervention is slim. But we also know that sexual offences are a category of psychologically motivated crimes that often escalate into murder. The pattern is clear and repetitive, and many of the serial murderers I've covered on this podcast have started out with the offender being convicted of rape, going to jail, getting out, and progressing to murder. When I chatted with forensic psychologist Gerard Labaskachny, this is one of the aspects of the parole system he felt needed work. If those in charge of granting parole do not understand how the crime in question plays out psychologically, they're not playing with a full deck of cards. They only have half the information they need to decide whether the offender in front of them is still a threat to society or not. And in this case, the parole board very clearly got it wrong, with deadly consequences. 
In researching today's case, I used Mickey Pistorius' book Strangers on the Street, as well as several media articles. So let's get into Episode 73, The Capitol Hill Murders. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Samuel Sedino was born in 1962. There is very little information about his formative years and what does exist consists of conflicting information provided by Samuel himself and his parents. According to his parents, Bra Mannenberg Sidio and Mam Labenio Sidio, Samuel grew up in Clipsbreit, a suburb to the south of Johannesburg. If you notice that there's a slight difference between Samuel's own surname and his parents, that's because somewhere along the line, Samuel changed his surname. His parents had no idea he'd done this until his name started to make headlines, and Samuel himself couldn't explain when and why he'd made the change. Samuel's parents say that they brought all their children up in a deeply religious environment, but when his father was asked to expand on his son's life story, he told a reporter he didn't have the emotional strength to tell the full story and would only say it was a long and sad tale. His father says that Samuel managed to achieve grade 11 before leaving school, but his early prison record states he only achieved grade 7. Samuel's adult life would be predominantly spent in and around the city of Pretoria. South Africa has three capital cities, and Pretoria is the executive capital. It would be in Pretoria on the 18th of January 1995 that Tembelichle Gaza arrived at Pretoria station to meet a man named Nicholas who was going to help her secure a job as a security guard. When Tembelichle arrived at the arranged meeting place, which was a guardhouse at the station, Nicholas was not there. Instead, she found his friend Samuel Sedino, who was also a security guard, and he said he'd be more than happy to help the young woman find employment. Tembelichle handed him her qualifications, and Samuel asked her to wait while he phoned his supervisor. He disappeared for a while, and when he returned, Samuel told her that his supervisor had said he should take her over to their training centre in downtown Pretoria. Tembelichle was excited at the prospect of a job, and more than happy to accompany Samuel. Samuel suggested that they take a shortcut through Fountain Valley, a popular nature reserve and picnic spot, but Tembelichle immediately became wary and told him that her stockings would get damaged if they walked through the area. Samuel was insistent, though, and her desire to take the next step in her employment journey soon overrode the warning bells that were going off in her head. She followed Samuel a few steps, but then her gut took over, and she refused to go any further. Samuel turned to her, his facial expression having completely changed from one of placid helpfulness to unabated rage. He punched Tembelichle in the face and told her that he had a gun in his bag and she'd better do what he told her to do. He instructed the terrified woman to remove her stockings and then pushed her to the ground, ripped off her underwear, and raped her. He then pushed her up against a tree and raped her again. When Samuel was finished, he threw Tembelichle's clothes at her and ordered her to get dressed. He said that if she told police, he would kill her. At that moment, Tembelichle saw two men approaching through the nature reserve. She decided to take a chance and ignore Samuel's threats and shouted out to the men for help because she'd just been raped. Thankfully for Tembelichle, the men reacted immediately and tackled Samuel. They found his security guard handcuffs and cuffed him and accompanied Tembelichle to the Pretoria Central Police Station while frog-marching Samuel a few steps behind 
so that she could open a case of rape. On the 12th of May 1995, Samuel Sedino was sentenced to just four years in jail. Today, the violence he inflicted upon Tembelichle, as well as the fact that he raped her twice, would likely have garnered him a far longer sentence. Whether his parole would have been handled differently, though, is another question entirely. Samuel served just over three years of his rape sentence. He was released in 1998, unemployed, and did not have anywhere to live. Samuel was married before he went to prison, but when he got out, he didn't make contact with his wife. Whether this was because she'd already indicated she wanted nothing to do with him, or if he'd just decided that what he had planned would be far easier if he was alone, is up for debate. Either way, upon his release from prison, he took shelter in an abandoned tower room on the crest of Capitol Hill in Pretoria North. From his vantage point in the tower room, Samuel would see Pretoria Zoo to the left and Langenhoven Secondary School at the foot of the hill. Capitol Park, the suburb, was on the other side of the ridge. Sedino began to earn money by selling vegetables at the train and working as a car guard at the zoo. On the 14th of December 1998, five months after Sedino was released from prison, Patrick Machlebanye, an attendant at Langenhoven Secondary School's golf course, spotted children removing flags on the golf course and started to chase them. The children ran up Capitol Hill with Patrick chasing after them. As they ran, they dropped the flags, which Patrick picked up. As he passed a nearby bush, he noticed a very bad smell coming from the area. Abandoning his chase of the naughty children, Samuel pushed into the bushes to investigate the source of the smell. He stumbled upon the decomposing body of a woman. Aghast, he ran to the nearest house to phone police. The female victim in the bush was dressed in a black dress and wore a black and white jacket. A pair of orange slip-on shoes lay near her body. She was found lying on her stomach, covered in branches. She appeared to have been strangled with a strip of material. By using fingerprints, detectives were able to identify the victim as Elizabeth Senwamadi. Elizabeth had recently taken over her mother's job as a domestic worker in a home at the foot of Capitol Hill. Her service at this job had been terminated at the end of November 1998, and Elizabeth had moved in with a friend called Christina, who lived in the area. Christina told detectives she'd last seen Elizabeth on the 8th of December. On the 26th of December 1998, Maureen Mavuka's 15-year-old grandson, Sipo, told her that he was going to the swimming pool at Shiden Station to attend swimming lessons. Sipo was dressed in a red and blue striped shirt, grey trousers and black shoes. Later that same day, a friend of Sipo saw him talking to an adult male at Hercules Station. The friend called out to Sipo to walk home with him, but Sipo said he was going with the older man who'd promised him a bicycle. Sipo's friend recognised the man as someone he'd seen selling vegetables and snacks at the station before. Sipo Mavuka was never seen alive again. Capitol Hill is close to many residential areas, and it's a popular spot for dog walking. On the 2nd of January 1999, a man and his son were walking their German Shepherd when they took a break to rest on a stone wall. Their dog, or Fleisch, sniffed around nearby and suddenly began to bark excitedly. The dog owner walked over to see what he was barking at and found a dead body underneath a tree. The body was covered with branches. The man pulled his dog back and fled with his son back home to call police. When Captain Henning van Asvirchen of the Pretoria Murder and Robbery Unit arrived at the scene, he found not one body, but two hidden under the branches. Both victims were male. One lay on top of the other. The victim underneath 
was far more decomposed than the one on top. The skull of one of the victims was missing, but detectives found it a few meters away. It had likely been removed by animals. Captain van Aswirchen immediately had a very bad feeling about the scene and instructed his men to search the entire area. An hour later, 600 meters from the first scene, another body was discovered. This victim was also male. The body was covered with branches, and his shoes and ID book lay nearby. The name in the ID book was Andres Mallorca, but the picture did not match the victim. The next day, detectives returned to search the entire Capitol Hill. They came across the tower room, which was situated almost directly between the various scenes. Although the area around the tower room was fenced off and padlocked, there was a hole cut in the fence, large enough for a person to climb through. The door to the room was also padlocked, but again, a hole had been cut in the door, large enough for someone to squeeze through. Inside the room, detectives found a coin security jacket with the name Sam on it, as well as several other items of clothing, two belts and a tin of snuff. The items were photographed in situ and then removed as evidence. On the 4th of January 1999, detectives were once again called out to Capitol Hill. Earlier that morning, the very same dog walker who'd found the two male bodies had been out for a walk again, and much to his horror, found another body in exactly the same place. This time, the victim was female. She was also covered with branches. In fact, she was covered with exactly the same branches police had removed from the previous victims and left in a pile next to the tree. There was now absolutely no doubt that Capitol Hill was a serial killer's hunting ground. Captain Andre Fabricius had previously received training in serial homicide investigation, and as such, he was asked to head up the investigation. After processing the new scene, the hill was put under surveillance. After two nights' surveillance, on the 6th of January 1999, Samuel Sedino was arrested as he returned to the tower room. The next day, Captain Fabricius attempted to interrogate Sedino, but he asserted his right to remain silent and would not cooperate. In the interim, two of the victims were identified. One was 15-year-old Sipo Mavuka. Since the boy had disappeared, his uncle had been searching hospitals and train stations in an attempt to find his nephew. On the 26th of January, he went to the mortuary and was shown the skull of a 15-year-old boy. He contacted Sipo's mother, who went into the police station and positively identified the clothing found with the body. She even had a photograph of him wearing that exact outfit. DNA samples would confirm that the remains found did indeed belong to Sipo. The victim found with the identity book was identified as Sholofela Mayoka. The ID book found with him belonged to his brother. Sholofela's mother was able to identify his clothing and DNA tests eventually confirmed his identity. The third victim sadly remained unidentified. He was a minor boy and likely around the same age as Sipo. The female victim found on the 4th of January was identified through fingerprints as Paulina Ledwaba. Paulina's boyfriend and her sister identified items belonging to her as well. On the 14th of January, Sedino was once again brought into the interview room and presented with the mass of evidence they had against him. He eventually agreed to cooperate with police and would go on to point out the various crime scenes. Accompanied by an officer with no connection to the case, Sedino directed police to Capitol Hill. At each scene he pointed out, he told the story of his crime. For the most part, he either didn't know or couldn't remember the victims' names, so he used fictional names for his retellings. He mentioned that he'd met one of his male victims while working as a car guard during November 1998. 
the men had earned a few rand together and decided to buy beer. Samuel had invited the man back to his room at the tower. He claimed as they climbed the hill, they began to argue about money, and he strangled the victim. When speaking about another of his male victims, Samuel claimed that he'd met the man on Capitol Hill, and they decided to go for a walk together. At one point, he says, the man had been hesitant to walk any further with him, and they'd started to argue. Samuel claims that the victim pulled out a knife, but he got the upper hand and strangled him. In explaining what had led to the death of the unidentified victim, Samuel claimed that he and the man had also met while trying to find work together. Again, Samuel claims that at some point, while walking on the hill, he and the victim had gotten into an argument, and he'd strangled him. Now, I'm going to play devil's advocate here, and say that I don't entirely believe Samuel's stories. I don't know why he feels the need to present himself as having been party to an argument in all these situations. Perhaps he just prefers to seem like a reasonable man who just found himself in several, strangely similar, unreasonable situations. But I think there's a very good chance that none of these victims got into an argument with Samuel, and he simply just led them to the hill with the very precise intention of killing them, simply because he enjoyed it, not because he was defending himself in any way. In speaking about one of his female victims, he said that he'd met the woman in the city centre. He claims that agreed to go up Capitol Hill to have sex, but when she demanded money from him for sex, he'd become enraged and killed her. Samuel said that he'd noticed that two of the bodies had been removed from under the tree, so he decided to place the female victim in that same spot. Before covering her with branches, he'd removed her jeans and proceeded to wear them until he was arrested. Surprisingly, Samuel actually led police to a scene on Capitol Hill that they hadn't found yet. Samuel told police that he'd met this young boy during the first week of 1999 at the train station. The young boy had offered to help Samuel sell some fruit he had. The child appeared to have possibly been homeless, as he'd allegedly asked Samuel if he could come and stay with him. Samuel claims he'd walked the boy up the hill. And then, yes, you guessed it, the young boy started an argument with him, and he was forced to strangle him and stole 24 rand that he had in his pocket. The only remains initially found at the scene from this victim was his skull. Much later, the rest of the body would be recovered, but he remained unidentified. Another female victim, Samuel said he'd offered to help look for work, and while they'd been walking on the hill, he'd asked for sex in exchange for the help he was giving her to find a job. He claims the victim had agreed, but said he should hurry up because she still wanted to go job hunting. Samuel claims this had enraged him and he'd strangled her. The scenario is so frighteningly similar to what happened with Samuel's first rape victim, and I strongly suspect, although police could not prove it, that the sex would never have been consensual. On the 16th of January 1999, two friends were climbing Michalisburg Mountain in Pretoria North. At four o'clock in the afternoon, the hikers smelled something bad and they found a body covered with branches. Police were called and as it was already getting dark, they guarded the scene until first light so that they could properly deal with it. When Captain Fabricius questioned Samuel about this murder, he confirmed that he had indeed committed the crime. Samuel told police that he'd met the Michalisburg victim while looking for work in Pretoria North. He suggested to the man that they could look for work in Dustport and get there by crossing the Michalisburg mountain. I don't need to tell you what Samuel claims happened next, but I will. They had an argument, and Samuel strangled the man. Considering this victim's body was already out there, 
when Samuel claimed to be making full pointing outs to the police, and he didn't tell them about it, tells me that there was a very good chance there were other victims that were either never found or the MO was simply not linked to Samuel. On the 9th of February, Samuel told police that he wanted to make a full confession in front of a magistrate. Captain Fabricius arranged for this to take place. Despite this confession, police knew very well that they needed to have the evidence in place and they could not rely on the confession alone. Far too many perpetrators end up going back on their confessions during trials and it would be negligent for any detective or prosecutor to rely on that alone. As a result, in the run-up to the trial, police made sure they checked and double-checked every piece of evidence they had. The MD of Coin Security viewed the jacket found in the tower room and confirmed, by using a staff number printed on it, that it had belonged to Samuel Sedino, who'd worked for the company between 1991 and 1993. A 30-day period of observation at Vescorpi Psychiatric Hospital pronounced Samuel fit to stand trial, and his trial commenced in August 2000. He was charged with seven counts of murder, two counts of rape, and one count of robbery. After presenting his confession, as well as all of the physical and witness testimony evidence, Samuel was found guilty of the seven counts of murder and the theft charge, but the state had been unable to prove the rape charges, so he was not found guilty on those. On the 5th of September, Samuel Sedino was sentenced to seven life sentences for the murders, plus an additional year for the theft. Samuel cut off all contact with his family after his arrest. While he was in prison, his sister tried to visit him five times, and he refused all visits, so she simply stopped trying. In her book, Strangers on the Street, Mickey Pistorius says that although it may be easy to assume that Samuel had used the exact same place for another body after the previous two had been removed because he was messing with police or trying to be funny. But she doesn't believe this to be the case. Pistorius believes that he didn't think twice about using the same place because it was part of his habit, which formed part of his fantasy. The reason that Pistorius believes that Samuel left all of his victims, bar one, on Capitol Hill boils down to the level of possessiveness which is seen in many serial killers. She noted this same trait in the likes of Moses Sotole and Sipo Twala as well, in that they left the bodies of their victims in clusters and the same general area in which they felt safe. This area became the killer's personal graveyard, And when police begin to find victims and, in a sense, disrupt their area, many killers become enraged, and this often leads to escalation, so that they can replace the victims that have been taken. Interestingly, the area in which Samuel had raped his first victim was right next to another hunting ground of a rather infamous South African serial killer. In the 1950s, Klapakop was the hunting ground of Phineas Chetandizi, also known as the Panga Man. This story is another very interesting serial killer tale, which I'll definitely be covering in another episode on its own. Samuel Sedino is the poster boy for increased vigilance around releasing violent sexual offenders back into society. It took just five months, at least as far as we know, for Samuel to start killing after he was released from jail. And who knows whether those were even his first murders. Is it possible that he could have killed other victims that weren't linked to him in 1995? Also, the fact that he returned to the same area where he'd committed his previous crimes and sought out a place to stay that was isolated seems to suggest that he already knew what he had planned the minute the key turned in his jail cell door. Samuel Sedino, if he is still alive, will be eligible for parole in 2040, according to Pistorius' book. While we don't know where our judicial system will be at that time, I can only hope 
that even though he will be in his 70s, he will not be released, and that our correction system will learn from the mistake they made the first time around. And of course, that begs the question, how many more Samuel Sedinos have just been released from prison? How many more criminal clocks are counting down to the point where they decide to start again? Elizabeth Senwamadi, Sipo Mafuka, Sholofela Mayoka, Paulina Ledwaba, and the three unidentified victims rest gently. Thank you for listening to episode 73, The Capitol Hill Murders. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the platform you're using to listen right now. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. I'll be back next Friday with another episode. Until then, as always, thank you for your support and I'll chat to you soon.